Back in April, fighting broke out around Khartoum, Sudan, between the military, led by Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the Rapid Support Forces, led by Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, in what Wikipedia is calling the 2023 Sudan Conflict. Geez, if journalism is the first draft of history, what the hell is Wikipedia? Anyways, if you're reading about it anywhere else, you'll see people calling it the start of a civil war. Now, whether this conflict will end up being a full-blown civil war or just a temporary crisis is yet to be seen, but the urge to call a civil war comes from the fact that since gaining independence in 1956, Sudan has had two full-blown civil wars and numerous other internal armed conflicts. So while we wait to see what becomes of the 2023 Sudanese brouhaha, let's take a look at one of these past conflicts, the First Sudanese Civil War. The roots of this conflict go back to before the colonial period. The northern Arab part of Sudan is primarily desert, and the peoples are culturally and ethnically tied to the Arab world, having converted to Sunni Islam centuries ago. The southern part of Sudan, what is today South Sudan, consisted of swamps and bogs, which prevented Arab armies from expanding southward and thus halted the expansion of Islam. This part of Sudan has more in common with the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. The northern Arab parts of Sudan were controlled on and off by Egypt over the centuries, and they had made numerous attempts at invading the south, but wouldn't have any success until the 1820s. At first they hunted elephants to harvest their tusks for the ivory market, but they eventually began capturing the South Sudanese and selling them into the Arab slave trade. The oppression of the Sudanese by the Egyptians eventually sparked a Muslim uprising against them, led by Muhammad Ahmed ibn Abdallah, who claimed to be the Mahdi, a messianic figure within Islamic eschatology, declaring a holy war against both the Egyptians and the British, who had recently taken control of Egypt. The uprising in northern Sudan would motivate an Anglo-Egyptian conquest of the region, finally defeating the Mahdists in 1898. The British would only penetrate southern Sudan in the early 1900s, and they would administer it as a separate territory, but they would spend far less money on economic development and education for the region. On the one hand, this meant that the South Sudanese got to retain a far greater amount of their pre-colonial culture than most other African colonies. On the other hand, though, it meant that they were not prepared for those who hadn't got to retain it. The British were mostly concerned with pacifying the more militant groups in the South, which was achieved by the early 1930s. Only then did British governors begin to seriously consider economically developing the region, but by then the Great Depression had hit, and what spare funds that existed weren't going to be spent in southern Sudan. Due to the lack of economic development during the colonial era, the South had no major domestic industries to generate revenue. This resulted in the modern economy being dominated by the northern Arab merchants, with many Southerners going north to find employment and providing cheap labor. As World War II came and went, the drive for decolonization grew stronger. Even the conservative government of Winston Churchill would go along with it, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anthony Eden, promising to grant Sudan independence. However, Eden and the British government were under pressure from both Egypt, who had declared its monarch Farouk as King of Egypt and Sudan, as well as the Truman administration, who was pressuring Eden to allow annexation. The violence of the Egyptian campaign to induce the Sudanese to align their future with Egypt would, in time, produce its own reaction. Egypt and the Sudan had many reasons for living on friendly terms, and we had no wish that they would not do so. But if the Egyptians were going to bribe or bully the Sudanese into unity, they would soon, I believed, be taught a sharp lesson. The British had helped the Sudanese establish their own parliament and were holding elections to create their own government, but the Egyptians were trying to influence the outcome. There were two major parties in northern Sudan, the Uma Party, and the National Unionist Party. The Uma Party was made up of remnants of the Mahdist movement, led by the Mahdi's son, Saeed Abdel Rahman El Mahdi. They were a conservative Islamist party who wanted to turn an independent Sudan into an Islamic theocracy. The National Unionist Party, or NUP, was led by Ismaili al-Azari and was closely associated with the Khatamiya Sufi order. They initially were an Arab nationalist party, not only favoring independence from the British, but also a political union with Egypt, and the Egyptian government would pour money into its coffers and they would win the most seats in the 1953 parliamentary elections, which made Al-Azari the prime minister. Al-Azari had intended to lead Sudan toward political union with Egypt, but while visiting western Sudan after the election, he saw the Arabs there were opposed to it, which led to the prime minister changing his position as well. This would anger the Egyptians, who would cease pouring money into the coffers of the NUP and redirect it into the arms budget of various rebel groups in Sudan. Now, although the South didn't have as much political organization as the North did, that didn't mean they weren't active at all, but they were systematically kept out of the process of independence. 
and you can help ensure your digital independence with this video sponsor, Aura. Aura takes a comprehensive approach to protecting your personal data, which is why they provide a VPN, password manager, antivirus software, parental controls, as well as providing identity and credit theft protection. Data breaches usually happen when someone is selling off your personal information. Aura can prevent these breaches by identifying these data brokers and automatically submitting opt-out requests for you. This will also help reduce the amount of junk mail and telemarketing you're exposed to as well. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach or exposed on the dark web, and will give you recommendations on what to do. So go ahead and let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. And if you sign up using my link, aura.com slash casual historian, you can get a 14 day free trial and it helps support the channel. Try it out and see how much of your personal information is just floating around on the internet for any ne'er-do-well to use. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this video, but for now, back to the history. In the Cairo Conference of 1953, which set up the rules for the elections that created its first parliament, the largest southern political group, the Liberal Party, were explicitly excluded from it, with the National Unionist Party and the Uma Party not recognizing their existence and basically saying, you do not get a say in the future of Sudan. Northerners would say that the South was not ready for self-government. The British tried to protect the interests of the South by getting the conference to discuss safeguards for Christian rights, but these were rejected by Northerners in Egypt, along with the demands for a federal system. Of the 800 governmental positions being vacated by the British, only six would be given to Southerners, and the British officers leading Sudanese troop would mostly be replaced by Northerners. Al-Azari tried to appease the dissidents by appointing numerous Southerners to administrative positions, but most of them were over sparsely populated rural areas that weren't even full status districts. He toured the South to try and rally support for independence and his government, promising to raise salaries for local officials, but he was frequently heckled by the locals and was nearly assassinated by a Southern official. At an event in Juba, a local politician, Daniel Tongan, would lead a walkout during one of his speeches. One of the few institutions of the South was the Equatoria Corps of the Sudanese Defense Forces, but rumors were beginning to spread that the government in Khartoum was planning on dissolving it. The rumors were amplified by an allegedly forged telegram that made its way through the ranks of Southern soldiers. To all my administrators in the Southern provinces, I have just signed a document for self-determination. Do not listen to the selfish complaints of Southerners. Treat them according to my orders. Any administrator who fails to comply with my orders will be liable to prosecution. In three months' time, all of you will come round and enjoy the work you have done. Not only did the government not investigate the origins of the telegram, but they seemed to do everything in their power to make it look as though it were 100% authentic. On August 14th, 1955, Khartoum ordered the evacuation of the families of northern officers in Torit, which made southern troops suspect something. That same day, a company of the Equatoria Corps was ordered to attend a ceremony in Khartoum, and one of the last Southern officers, M.T. Tafang, was arrested on August 16th, and he asserted that moving troops to Khartoum was part of a trap. On August 16th, 1955, Parliament voted to evacuate foreign troops from Sudan, while additional troops were sent from Khartoum to Juba. And on August 18th, Southern troops in Torit refused the order to go to Khartoum and instead attacked their Northern officers and looted the armory. News of the incident spread and led to further mutinies in Juba, Ye, Yambio, and Meredi. In some of these towns, local merchants used the chaos as an excuse to attack rival Arab merchants. The mutiny didn't come out of nowhere. Back in October, the Southern politician, Daniel Tongan, began meeting with Marco Room. They would meet with a group of southern NCOs who conspired to get the British in Kenya to aid them in their mutiny against the Arabs. A southern lieutenant, Albino Tongan, would take two companies to link up with the King's African Rifles along the border with Uganda, but they refused to join the Equatoria Corps in their mutiny. Despite it being in the works for months, the timing of it was ultimately not planned. Prime Minister Al-Azari would try to tamp down the mutiny by offering a fair trial for any soldier that surrendered to the government, but the mutineers largely rejected the offer and instead demanded the evacuation of northern troops from the south. He would message the British for assistance, and the Royal Air Force would help deliver 8,000 northern troops to the south. The British Governor General would make the same offer to the mutineers as Al-Azari, Taking the British promise more seriously, the mutineers began to hand themselves over to government forces. 
Across the South, they were told to report to particular spots to meet with soldiers and hand over their weapons. But those that did found themselves gunned down by the Northern security forces. As word of the broken promises spread, the mutineers abandoned their positions and instead went into the swamps and jungles or crossed the border into neighboring Uganda and the Belgian Congo, where they would begin to wage a guerrilla insurgency against the government. By the end of August, northern troops managed to put down the mutineers, which was followed by a draconian crackdown on the south, and all of those who were perceived as aiding them. The southern merchants who took up arms against their Arab neighbors and competitors were arrested and sent to prison, but many Arab merchants who didn't take up arms against their Arab neighbors were also arrested and sent to prison for not being sufficiently helpful in protecting them, and in some towns, merchants who actively helped and protected their Arab neighbors would also be sent to prison. Northern troops would abuse and torture southern civilians, set homes on fire, and confiscate property and livestock. Paratroopers were dropped in to attack southern policemen at Malakal, who were completely unaware of the mutiny at the time. By October of 1955, the Equatoria Corps had been liquidated, and southern soldiers and police in the south were replaced by northerners. This repression would force thousands of refugees to flee to neighboring countries. After the mutiny, an investigation discovered the names of Daniel Tongan and Marco Room in telegrams describing the plan. They were arrested along with several soldiers from the Equatoria Corps, which sparked protests. The government feared additional mutinies, so they arrested an additional 1,700 southerners, which included merchants and tradesmen. Despite the mutiny and all the concerns over human rights abuses against the South Sudanese, the Sudanese parliament would vote for independence on December 19, 1955, which would be formally granted on January 1, 1956. Southern politicians in parliament became vocal and threatened to secede from the North if the government didn't adopt federalism, but the demands were ignored. When a committee to draft a new constitution was formed in 1956, only three of the 46 committee members were Southerners, and they were ignored again, and eventually walked out in protest. And the committee would declare, The Sudan is a unitary parliamentary democratic republic. Islam is the official religion of the state, and Arabic is the official language of the state. Independence from the British would not end the repression of the South. Sudanese forces would intimidate Southerners into compliance through collective punishment. If they encounter some kind of resistance in or near a town, they would round up the people of that village and arrest tons of them and set their homes on fire if they are believed to have aided the guerrillas in any way. About 10,000 houses in the South were burned in 1957 alone. Southerners were discriminated against for jobs in both the public and private sector, and some jobs were explicitly reserved for Northerners. The 1958 election saw commissioners violate the laws in favor of northern parties. Restrictions on running for office resulted in many Arab candidates running for southern seats unopposed. But after the election, southerners managed to win 36 seats, with 25 representing southern parties. The Uma party under Abdallah Khalil would win 63 seats, and the People's Democratic Party won 27, with the NUP 45. The Uma party would form a coalition government with the PDP, with Khalil becoming prime minister. When the Uma party took power, they tried to adopt a new constitution, transforming Sudan into an Islamic kingdom with their spiritual leader, Abdel Rahman El Mahdi, being made king. 1958 was a year of tumult in the Middle East. In February, Egypt and Syria entered into political union to form the United Arab Republic. That same month, Jordan and Iraq merged to form the Arab Federation, with Iraq's king, Faisal II, as its head of state only for the federation to be dissolved after a coup in Iraq deposed and executed the king. The native insurgency in Algeria created a political crisis in France, leading to the fall of the Fourth Republic. And violence in Lebanon led to the first American intervention under President Eisenhower. Due to this, the Sudanese government would request protection from the British government, fearing a potential invasion from Egypt. The economy was collapsing, and protests erupted in Khartoum in October of 1958. General Ibrahim Aboud would, in his own mind, step up to save Sudan from collapse. On November 17, 1958, Prime Minister Khalil agreed to hand power over to Aboud. He decreed a state of emergency, setting up a military government and becoming acting Prime Minister, President, and Commander-in-Chief. General Aboud tightened central authority over the south, garrisoning extra troops and deploying forces along its borders. 
the government would broadcast messages about reprisals against southern dissidents, and northern merchants in the south would spread rumors about southern guerrillas in order to get the government to increase military activity in the region. Abood ordered the regional governors to suppress political speech calling for federalism or independence. He launched a military operation called Nadafa Janub, which translates as Cleansing the South. It was focused on eliminating rebel camps along the borders. Not just rebel camps would be destroyed, but entire villages would be burned. Refugees from these villages would make their way to rebel camps across the border. Abood also sought to Arabize and Islamicize the South. The judicial system in the South was handled by their chief's courts, but in 1960 this right was stripped from them. Their traditional African laws would be replaced by the Abood regime's interpretation of Sharia. They gave the chiefs an ultimatum, convert or lose your positions. He also mandated all government services be administered in Arabic rather than native languages or English. Those who could not speak Arabic lost their jobs, which meant the positions administering the South were staffed by Northerners. A government official from the North was recorded saying this to some Southern officials. We are not interested in seeing you praying and fasting. Our main aim is to see you call yourselves Muslims and then convert your people so they in turn can convert their present children who are Christians. That Christianity is a foreign religion and should have returned to Europe with the colonialists. In 1957, the Christian mission schools had been nationalized, which was not initially opposed by the Southerners, believing it would result in increased funding from the central government. But this was just the first volley in a war on Christianity. The nationalization of the mission schools was an important step in the direction which recognizes cultural unification. And we of the Department of Religious Affairs are ready to do our duty. We have begun with the opening of Islamic centers in the southern provinces, and we will not cease to work in the direction until we have realized the cultural Islamic unity we seek. That same year, Khalil's government created the Department of Religious Affairs, which was tasked with making sure that their programs were in line with Islamic doctrine, as well as creating programs and institutions in order to inculcate Islam within the South. They built Islamic schools in the region, and all children, regardless of religious background, were required to attend classes there. The secondary schools were run and taught in Arabic. Knowledge of Islam and the Arabic language became a requirement to attend Southern schools, which was on top of the fees parents had to pay. This resulted in a drastic drop-off in education levels for Southerners. Parents had to declare their religious affiliation when enrolling in schools, and those who practiced traditional religions but expressed an interest in converting to Christianity were threatened with the loss of educational opportunities for their children, as well as with physical violence toward the parents. In 1959, Abood's regime refused to grant new permits to foreign Christian missionaries. When missionaries in the country asked for permission to relocate, they were denied. The state banned Christian institutions from teaching anything other than religion and prayer, and in the province of Equatoria, the governor banned all public meetings of more than three people. The origins of all the misfortunes and contrarieties in our way is the Roman Catholic Church and the greater part of these evils come from it. They do not cease to instill their poison and create the spirit of racial division, and even tempt others to mistrust the authority and law. This evil, which is represented by the Catholic priests, should be rooted out. Missionaries were not allowed to open new churches or seminaries without government permission, and could not engage in economic activity at all. The central government banned all foreign missionaries from entering the South without special permission. By 1960, all official non-religious activity performed by missionaries and churches had ceased. The ability of missionaries to preach was so restricted that reading the Bible aloud in public could be enough to get you arrested. In November 1962, the government issued the Regulations for Missionary Societies, which placed so many regulations on the actions of missionaries that doing home repair on your own dwelling could qualify you for deportation. And in January of 1963, 150 missionaries were. The preaching of the gospel of Christ is no longer desirable by the Republic of the Sudan. The practical application of the gospel teaching is against the law. Strongly enforced restrictions have been placed on the people of the country and on Catholic and Protestant missionary society so as to affect the discontinuance of Christianity in the Republic of Sudan. In March of 1964, 215 more missionaries were expelled. Southern intellectuals said the government was using the propaganda and expulsion of the foreign missionaries to distract the world from the plight of Southerners. The London Times said that the expulsion was about removing foreign observers from witnessing the repression of the military government. 
but the Catholic Church would be successful in getting Catholics around the world to lobby their governments to act. But Abu's regime would also act against domestic political rivals. In December of 1960, Abood's government was planning to arrest a large number of southern politicians and intellectuals, so a bunch of them fled to Uganda. In 1961, they formed the Sudan Christian Association, which worked to procure financial and material support for refugees living in neighboring countries. In February of 1962, the Sudan African Closed Districts National Union was founded in Leopoldville. William Deng, Father Saturnino, and Joseph Oduhu would visit Nigeria, Congo Brazzaville, and the Central African Republic to gather support. The organization would change its name to the Sudan African National Union because it fell in lines with other organizations of the time. Sanu was deeply involved in disseminating information about what was going on in Sudan to the exiles and delivering literature from the exiles to southern Sudan. The guerrilla movement, which began after the 1955 mutiny, would only grow after Abood's coup. And at the beginning, they didn't have much to fight with. I mean, they were fighting with bows and arrows and spears and only acquired firearms after looting them from dead soldiers and police. In 1960, Southern politicians such as Joseph Oduhu and Father Saturnino began organizing a guerrilla movement domestically. In December, they met up in Uganda with other politicians to organize more camps outside the country and the refugee communities living in these countries would be their recruits. A politician in the Upper Nile, Philip Padak, recruited an exile in Ethiopia, Daniel Nyong, who would set up a guerrilla base at Tirgal in Ethiopia. Another camp would be set up in Pachala in southern Sudan for the Upper Nile resistance, and in eastern Equatoria, militants founded Agu Camp in January of 1963. In Khartoum, Darius Bashir founded the Southern Front, which connected exiles with intelligence going on inside Sudan, as well as providing propaganda material for the Southerners in the Southern cause. They also worked on procuring funds as well as escorting people to various guerrilla camps and cells. Sanu would open offices in Ethiopia, Kenya, the Congo, and London. And in early 1964, the political climate of Uganda made it palatable to relocate the headquarters there from Kinshasa. However, divisions began to emerge between the leaders along tribal, ethnic, and sectarian lines, as well as nomenclature and finances. The organization had no bank account, with the leaders receiving the money and deciding themselves how to spend it. They would receive money from South Sudanese exiles, as well as the Catholic Church. In July of 1963, Oduhu and Saturnino visited Western Europe to solicit foreign intervention and financial assistance. They would encourage Southern officers in the Sudanese military to defect and join Sanu, such as Joseph Lagu. They also reached out to Prime Minister Obote of Uganda to negotiate the release of imprisoned members of the Equatoria Corps. Southern politicians and military leaders met in Kampala, Uganda in August 1963 to draw up a comprehensive military plan. They would name their movement Anyanya, which was a merging of the words Anyanya, meaning a deadly snake venom, and Manyanya, meaning army ant. Local branches, however, would operate under different names that had more resonance with their languages and cultures. The first organized attacks by Anyanya were launched in September of 1963 in eastern Equatoria. Abood was getting desperate to resolve the crisis and asked civilians to submit proposals. However, this didn't just invite critiques of his policy towards the South, but towards his other policies as well. These proposals were being submitted to a seminar at the University of Khartoum called The Problem of the Southern Sudan, which was raided by riot police on October 20th, 1964. This sparked nationwide protests and a general strike. Abu responded by creating an interim government and stepping down from power. The protesters and strikers, with some retired politicians, formed the United National Front, who were brought into the provisional government after Abood stepped down. The UNF selected a senior civil servant, Sir Al-Khatim Al-Khalifa, to be the prime minister of the interim government, who allowed the return of political parties. After the fall of Abood's regime, the Southern Front emerged as an active political party, which focused on fundraising and providing aid for Anyanya activities. A member of the Southern Front, Clement Maboro, would secretly aid the organization while serving as Minister of the Interior for Al-Khalifa's government. A convention was held in Kampala in November 1964 in order to reorganize Sanu. A battle for leadership occurred between the General Secretary, Joseph Oduhu, and Agre Jaden, with support from Joseph Lagu. Jaden would become the first elected president of Sanu, 
with Philip Padak appointed vice president and Oduhu named secretary for legal and constitutional affairs. Jaden then sent diplomatic representatives to the USSR, US, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, the Central African Republic, and the Congo. Prior to the convention in Kampala, William Deng was in contact with Khartoum, and after the fall of Abu's regime, Al Khalifa implied that negotiation was now possible. Deng was promised autonomy for the South, as well as the vice presidency. Deng would return to Sudan in February 1965, and founded a rival group that would eventually be designated Sanu Inside, with the original Sanu being designated Sanu Outside. Philip Padak would defect to Deng's group, while Father Saturnino would ally himself with Joseph Oduhu. In March of 1965, the first roundtable conference was held in Khartoum between the UMA and National Unionist Party representing Northern Sudan and representatives from Sanu Inside, Sanu Outside, and the Southern Front. Internal divisions within the Southern groups caused fractured demands, leading to the failure of the meeting. In June of 1965, Sanu Inside rebranded as the Azania Liberation Front, and Jaden responded by rebranding his organization the Sudan African Liberation Front. Elections in Sudan were scheduled for March of 1965, but with the insurgency in the South, voices in Parliament proposed postponing the election until fighting ceased so they could participate, and thus the new constitution would be seen as more legitimate. Southern politicians as well as leftist parties also supported postponing the elections, fearing that the election schedule didn't give them enough time to organize. The government decided to resign in response to this opposition. A new president was instated, and they directed that elections be held wherever it was possible. The leftist parties would boycott the election. The elections were a mess. The ballots had so many candidates that most of the winners didn't win a majority of the votes in their districts. The UMA party captured 75 of the 158 seats, while the NUP took 52, and they formed a coalition government, with the UMA leader, Muhammad Ahmad Majoub, becoming prime minister. Majoub's government had two priorities, ending the insurgency in the south, and removing the communists from all positions of power they obtained since Abud stepped down. To achieve the first, the army began a brutal campaign against the southern rebels. To achieve the second, parliament approved a decree banning the communist party and expelling its members from parliament. On July 8, 1965, security forces in Juba went on a rampage in the neighborhoods of Malakia and Krator, burning down homes and indiscriminately shooting civilians. The killing stopped the morning of July 9th, and when they examined all the bodies, the guy who was blamed for starting the fight by stabbing a northern soldier to death was nowhere to be found. The conservative estimate of deaths is about 1,400 people, with some civilians drowning in the Nile to escape the soldiers. A southern intellectual would write of the incident, This cannot but stand as indisputable proof of our contention that the northern army under the orders of the government is carrying out a genocide and systematic extermination of the Negro population of the southern Sudan. Another massacre happened on July 10th, 1965 in Wau. Northern soldiers surrounded a home where a southern wedding was taking place and began shooting into it. The soldiers then went into the home and found the men who had hid from the bullets and executed them. The only survivors were those who pretended to be dead. Similar incidents would occur in Juba, Malakal, and Torit. Clement Maboro went to investigate the Juba incident, and when he arrived, he told the residents, All of you who are here, all of you leave the town and go to the forest. Go and save your lives. When Maboro and his delegation returned to Khartoum, they had to sneak all of the evidence and testimonies they'd recorded back into the city because their bags were being checked by the police. On July 12, 1965, the Southern Front Central Committee described the massacres as a Nazi type of extermination policy. They asked the UN and OAU to intervene, as well as reaching out to the governments of Uganda, Kenya, Egypt, Ghana, Nigeria, and Algeria. The UMA NUP coalition fell apart in October of 1965 over disputes whether the prime minister or president held authority over foreign policy. Majoub remained prime minister until July 1966, when parliament censured him. This split the UMA party between the party's spiritual leader, Imam al-Hadi, and the imam's nephew, Sadiq al-Mahdi, who rejected religious sectarianism. Sadiq became prime minister with the backing of his wing of the UMA as well as the NUP. In 1966, the Sudanese government was putting pressure on Uganda and Kenya for harboring insurgents, which forced southern leaders to leave Uganda. Elia Lupe went to the Congo while Oduhu went to Ditto in Sudan and declared it the capital of southern Sudan. 
In January 1967, Father Saturnino was killed by Ugandan soldiers as part of the partisan politics of Uganda, which were affiliated with Christian denominations. The Ugandan president, Milton Obote, was affiliated with the Protestants. In 1966, the Sudanese government began setting up concentration camps in a policy they referred to as collectivization. Soldiers went into villages and forcibly relocated southerners to these camps. The northerners justified the policy, claiming the civilians were providing aid and comfort to the rebels. Many would die of hunger and disease. Entire tribes were forcibly relocated from the south to the north, which resulted in many more deaths. The program was very expensive, and by November of 1966, about 50,000 people had been relocated through it. Cholera and other diseases were rampant, and they spread from the camps to other villages. South Sudanese outside of Sudan reached out to international organizations for assistance in dealing with the epidemics. But Sudanese embassies tried to intervene, covering up the cholera outbreaks. The Supreme Court of Sudan overturned legislation that banned the Communist Party, but Sadiq refused to obey the decision. In response, communist officers and the army attempted a coup in December 1966, but it failed which resulted in a crackdown against communists in the country. Parliament had not approved the concessions he had made in order to appease southern political leaders, and the Islamist wing of the Uma party opposed him for supporting religious freedom. Both the Islamists and the NUP withdrew their support from Sadiq, which caused his government to fall, which led to Majub being made prime minister again. However, his coalition was frail. Sadiq's wing of the Uma had a majority of seats in parliament, Majub would dissolve parliament in early 1968, but Sadiq refused to recognize the legitimacy of the action. Both men claimed to be the rightful government. One of the groups met in the parliament building, and the other met on the lawn outside. The Supreme Court backed Majub's government and called for the new elections to be held in April 1968. The new election saw the DUP, a merger of the NUP and PDP, win 101 of 218 seats, with the UMA traditionalists controlling 36 and the Sadiq wing winning 30, with Sanu and the Southern Front winning 25. The DUP would form a coalition with the Uma traditionalists, who gave the premiership back to Majub. They planned to reorganize the government and build closer ties with the rest of the Arab world. They also began receiving support from the Soviet Union. Sadiq's party refused to participate in the drafting of the new constitution, which the government responded to by shutting down opposition newspapers and cracking down on pro-Sadiq demonstrations. By late 1968, the wings of the Uma party reconciled and agreed to support a new leader, Imam al-Hadi al-Mahdi. While all of the internal drama was going on in the north, the southern resistance were having their own internal disputes. In 1967, after Sanu outside had gone bankrupt, Jaden agreed to step down from the leadership and allowed a merger of the ALF and SALF, which kept the ALF name. Oduhu was made president and Jaden was named vice president, but in August of 1967, a meeting was held in Western Equatoria in order to form a government for the South, which would be called the South Sudan Provisional Government. And the guerrilla factions were merged together into the Anyanya National Armed Forces. The convention would prevent ethnic conflict by providing equal representation to all three southern provinces. Jaden became president, Camille Dole became the first minister of communications, Michael Tawil as Minister of Social Affairs, and George Kawani as Minister of Information. Joseph Oduhu wasn't there because he was running his own self-proclaimed government in Ditto. It was also the first time both military and political leaders were brought together. However, fighting did occur between the supporters of Oduhu and the SSPG. Gordon Mortat, the SSPG foreign minister, and Jaden would go to Uganda and Kenya to meet with the Israelis. A leader in Oduhu's ALF, had been arrested by Okuat Atem, the SSPG defense minister. While Jaden was out of the country, Atem ordered the execution of the ALF leader against the president's orders. Fearing for his own life, Jaden told his cabinet that he would be visiting a relative in Kampala, but he never returned, abandoning leadership of the SSPG. Morta went to Kampala to convince Jaden to come back, who expressed concerns over his authority being questioned by Atem and Joseph Lagu. In March of 1969, a second convention was held in Balgobindi in Zaire in order to re-solidify the movement. The meeting was chaired by Vice President Dole, while Oduhu and Jaden did not attend. The SSPG would rename itself the Nile Provisional Government. They also declared all southern political parties or movements in exile to be illegal. They also drafted and adopted a constitution. They elected Gordon Mortat as the new president, 
and Marco Room as vice president. They also established a new military, the Anyanya National Army Forces. Major General Amadeo Tafeng Lodongi was made commander-in-chief of the Anaf. However, he would betray the SSPG, forming the Anyindi Revolutionary Government, and working with Rolf Steiner, a German mercenary who promised Tafeng support from the German government if he fought the Arabs separately. He also convinced Tafeng to launch a coup against Mortat. The coup plan was leaked in a Ugandan newspaper in August of 1969, which claimed that the NPG government had already been overthrown. The attempted coup ended in failure. Competition over leadership of the Anyanya led to rivals assassinating each other in the Upper Nile. Lagu was angry at Jaden for appointing Tafeng as commander-in-chief of Anaf, and sought to undermine Tafeng's authority. Tafeng was illiterate and was only appointed because he held the loyalties of the Latuko people. Lagu reached out to Levi Eshkol after the Six-Day War back in 1967, congratulating him on his victory over the Arabs. He also offered to support Israel by having the Anyanya hold down the Sudanese army so they couldn't send troops to help the Egyptians. After Eshkol's death, Goldemayur arranged Lagu's visit to Israel, where Mir promised material support until the Addis Ababa Agreement was signed in 1972. Throughout 1969, Murtaugh made contact with the Israelis through various African embassies, in which he negotiated financial and military assistance. However, the Israelis were skeptical about the civilian leadership of the NPG, and would also work with its military leaders directly, such as Joseph Lagu. Murtaugh was so distressed, he announced an intent to dissolve the NPG so that Lagu could ascend to power. However, his officers asked that instead, Lagu be labeled a rebel, and allow the Anaf to go after him. They hoped that by eliminating Lagu, the Israelis would have no choice but to work with the NPG. But Mortat refused to do this, not wanting to encourage further infighting. In July of 1970, Lagu launched a coup against Mortat, in which he willingly gave up power and offered his support. The NPG was abolished. At this point, Tafeng pledged allegiance to Lagu's government and then retired. Mortat would leave Sudan for the UK in April of 1971. Lagu would decentralize the Anyanya, having regional, tribal, and ethnic groups serving in their home areas. Back in the north, on May 25, 1969, Colonel Ghaffar Nimri led a coup against the government of President Ismail al-Hazari, seizing key government buildings and radio stations in Khartoum, and arresting other generals at 4 a.m., by 7 a.m., they began playing pre-recorded speeches from Namiri outlining their plans for the government. The coup was led by a free officers movement, inspired by similar movements elsewhere in the Arab world. Nimiri would pursue radical Arab nationalist policies, but also included officers in his regime that were members of or had ties to the communists and Nasserites. One of these officers was Hashem al atta in March of 1971, Niemiri's government began orchestrating plans to nationalize the trade unions as well as banning communist organizations. He also created the Sudan Socialist Union, which was given control of all the assets of communist organizations and parties, and arrested communist party leaders. On July 19, 1971, a group of communist army officers, led by Hashem al atta orchestrated a coup against the regime of Ghaffar Niemiri. They stormed the presidential palace and took Nimri and his council prisoner. They gained control of the capital, but not much else. The neighboring regimes of Anwar Sadat and Muammar Gaddafi also opposed the coup. Gaddafi would go so far as to use his air force to halt a British Airlines flight that was carrying a Sudanese colonel supporting the coup. The only Arab regime to respond positively to the coup was Baathist Iraq. They sent an airliner of government representatives to congratulate the Sudanese officers, but it crashed under mysterious circumstances over Saudi Arabia. To prevent a counter-coup, Atta ordered that all of the tanks in the region of Khartoum be immobilized, as well as putting other units that were believed to not be loyal to him on leave. He did this on advice from the Soviets. Three days later, officers and units loyal to Nimri would launch their counter-coup, freeing Nimri and arresting Atta and many other communists, executing many of them, including Atta, along with the officers that Gaddafi had captured. After the counter-coup, Nimri expelled East German security advisors and denounced the USSR and the Eastern Bloc for supporting the coup. The World Council of Churches and the All-Africa Conference of Churches mediated a peace agreement between the SSLM and the Sudanese government, resulting in the Addis Ababa Agreement in March of 1972, which ended the conflict. 
the agreement created a southern regional government with its own assembly and an executive council. Law enforcement would be handled by the regional government, but they were not allowed to have their own military and were still under the sovereignty of the Khartoum government. The agreement, however, would only last a decade. Thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this video. If you want a 14 day free trial to see how much of your information is just floating online for everyone to take and use for their own, then check out aura.com slash casual historian. I'd also like to thank my patrons for making this video possible. Their support allows me to spend more time on a bit more niche subjects like this. And let me tell you how annoying this video was. There's so little visual material to work from. So their support allows me to spend a little more time with subjects like this. So, Thank you all for that. If you're interested in supporting this channel and helping maybe see your video at the end of the screen like this, then check out patreon.com slash casual historian to learn more. You get stuff like access to a patrons only discord, get access to early videos. It's great. Check it out. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time.